Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming in, um, especially on such a warm, hot evening. I've been melting here. Um, this is a, a presentation that's based on an article that I wrote for Green World. Um, Green World is the online magazine for the Green Party. Um, some of you may know it. Um, it wasn't particularly making a political statement. It was more it was more to do with they were the ones who, who wanted to publish it. Great, um, get it out there. Um, so yeah, it's the importance of urban areas for nature. Um, I think they're highly important because we live here. Um, and I will be, I, I just want to say a couple of things before we move on. Um, I will be, when I say urban, I'll be talking about London a lot. Um, when I say nature, I'll be talking about birds a lot because I know more about birds than other aspects of nature. Uh, and also I understand that as an audience, because you're part of the RSPB, Central London Group, that in a, in a way I'm preaching to the converted. But bear with me on some of the points that you may um, think you already know or, or believe in. Um, just bear with me because I, I'd like to put... Um, challenge some of our perceptions and also by the end I'd like to say um, like us to think about what we can do um, although we are people already engaged in nature um, is there anything else we can do okay moving on from the first slide Um, are you hearing me, Graham? Ah, right. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, there was a slow, not a slow for some reason. So, yeah, the importance of urban areas for nature. And I've got two um, opposing images, if you like. On the left-hand side, we've got, some would say, a typical rural idyllic scene. And on the right, we have a typical urban scene. Uh, and I want to challenge this idea uh, that I certainly was brought up with. I came from a, a sort of small town um, in the Midlands. This idea of countryside, countryside is where is, is the lovely place where all nature is and against the city life where you wouldn't expect nature. And I want to challenge those years and years that... Uh, have built up and, 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 and still do in some ways um, affect me. I'll start off by looking at UK land use as a total. Um, so there's some figures. Um, so just under 70% of our uh, total land in the UK is for agriculture. And where we live, where we work, factories and offices and residences make up around 12% and then there's a few other figures marine and coastal as you can see uh, interesting figure at the bottom I think is we have got a decent amount of woodland that isn't just agricultural woodland just under 10% but if we take that figure of 12% out of the equation we find that there's nearly 80% of our land use is over for agriculture and not to put too fine a point of it on it most of that agricultural use is basically an open air factory it's not in the business of serving what we would like nature it's in the business of food production and i don't want to i'm not knocking farmers farmers are under pressure they have uh and this country is under pressure because of you know we're dense uh, we are a densely populated country so it's not knocking those i'm just being realistic about it you'll also see at the at the top i put andy peters and you'll notice uh, through this presentation that uh, I, I put these odd little things they're just triggers for me to uh, uh, to move on and to put it in context, less than 1% uh, of, the, of the land use in England is down to nature reserves. 
Andy Peters. Andy Peters is a chap who does the competitions on GMTV. About three weeks ago, he did this uh, really big prize competition on GMTV. I think it was something like £300,000 cash. And part of the prize was to have a holiday in the UK because of COVID of anywhere in you, anywhere of your choice. And through this, as he's, and it's a good sort of two or three minutes that he's explaining the competition. And during this explanation, there are various idyllic images of holidays in the UK. And two of them really struck me. One of them was a combine harvester in a wheat field. Hmm. And the honeymoon shot was very similar to the right hand shot here. It was a rapeseed oil, lot, a, a massive expanse of yellow. And I'm thinking, so here we have two images, which are basically industrial farming, put up as some kind of aspirational device of us winning a competition and a holiday of our choice. We co it couldn't be farther removed from the truth for, 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 for several reasons, but the two main ones are uh, those images were certainly not of a natural countryside where we would expect to see nature. In fact, they're pretty dead, pretty biodiversity pretty is much lacking. And similarly, we can't just walk anywhere we want in, in one of these rapeseed oil um, fields. So I, ju I just mentioned that because it just shows you in our culture how deeply entrenched this idea of countryside, rural, idyllic myth, it's where nature is, versus our urban environments where most of us live, and that is not where we expect or, or see nature. It couldn't be farther from the truth in some ways. So moving on and looking at this um, arable landscape, um, a lot of you will know this, and I, we could go right back to Macedonia and you know blame it on stop being nomads and we became farmers and we destroyed the land use. More appropriately for this, um, certainly there was a, a big change in the way we treated land. Um, so uh, it started, the big changes started in World War II when there was an effort, uh, um, uh, food for victory, and our landscape in, in changed quite considerably. But it was in the 50s when there was a lot more mechanization, and then particularly in the 70s when there was a real change in the intensification of agriculture that our landscape changed and to the negative effect of nature and here's a just a running through a list that we probably all already know there's an increase in monocultures um, rise in the use of fertilizers widespread use of pesticides and a loss of really good habitat drainage of wetlands hedgerow removal, loss of hay meadows, the list goes on. And similarly, on a pastoral landscape, the effect of grazing animals. Sorry, I should go back there. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention is there's a famous Chris Packham uh, quote, if we stuck a uh, housing estate on that rapeseed oil field, there'd be more biodiversity. And he's right, there would be. Um, that's a monoculture. There's not much there except those trees around the farmhouse. Similarly, there's not much going on in terms of biodiversity on most pastoral landscapes either. And in fact, there's been a big negative effect on, on nature. Um, for instance, initially, obviously, there's a lot of deforestation um, to get grazing landscapes. Uh, we, we uprooted a lot of scrub and heathland, and the animals themselves. Uh, create problems, compaction and erosion, which um, have a negative effect on drainage and flooding. And, and we're all probably aware also of uh, something that's been going on, I don't know, probably the last five years, the destruction of our moorlands. Um, basically, we intensively farm red grouse for 0.001% of the population to shoot them. And there's immense uh, environmental damage. Uh, not just on hen harriers, which are used as a, uh, 
a way, if you like, of, uh, of highlighting this issue, but also on the land itself and on, on humans in the effect on drainage. And there's certainly been flooding away from the moorlands because of the way they're managed. What's this meant for our bird life? Um, this is a, a, a graphic that you can easily pick up off the BTO website. Um, yes, all um, sectors of the bird populations have gone down since the 70s, but some more than others. And as you can see, it's the farmland birds that have suffered in terms of abundance um, almost consistently since the, uh, particularly the mid 70s. And more specifically, um, yes, so there's a decrease in numbers across all sectors, particularly farmland species, but look at that. I mean, starlings down 80%, it's unbelievable, a common bird. We know about house sparrows, house sparrows have sort of been the darlings of the environmental community, well, sort of the main, mainstream media, but Starlings are cheeky and perhaps scallions that we all love as well. Um, and birds of conservation concern. Look at these common birds. House sparrow, starling, songthrush, red wing, missile thrush. All birds that I perceive in my head as common birds, but they're red listed of highest conservation concern. Um, it, it's red listed, it, it, it's... Um, basically, it's a traffic light system, so you've got green, amber, and red, and green is of least concern. And then some non-avian examples that we probably already know about as since that sort of same time period, the mid-70s, it's been a 45% decrease of all invertebrates in this country, 66% decrease in the common toad, 75% decrease in hedgehogs. So it's a cross nature. Oh, it's all very well, this bloke talking, knocking, knocking a countryside, but isn't it the same in urban environments? Well, to an extent it is. There has been a decrease in abundance of birds in urban environments across that time, as, time period as well. And generally, worldwide, there are exceptions, and London is slight exception in this, there generally is an urban rural gradient. Um, in other words, as you get more urban, there tends to be a decrease in species. And that is because there's a decrease in the abundance of vegetation and a decrease, importantly, in diversity of vegetation. And there is a paper out there also that has proved uh, for a couple of cities that actually bird mass increases what it says is basically as you get into more concrete um, uh, environments the birds get bigger and so you get you're more likely to get crows and you're more likely to get pigeons and and gulls and smaller birds tend to be on a, a, a less so moving on um what I want to now is, is, is set up this idea that actually that, that in London, um, it's not all doom and gloom. It's not, yes, there has been a reduction, um, but it is still a very important for two major reasons. And the two major reasons are the surprising amount of green space, which is not farmed. And two, we live here. 82% of us live in urban environments in this country. So specifically using London as an example, this is a fantastic map that some of you may have seen, produced by Google, Green, the green Space Information for Greater London. And it's, it's a green map, it's showing the green areas. And that translates into London having 47% green space, which when I first saw that, I was, I, was, I wouldn't say shocked, but I was genuinely surprised. Um, I wouldn't have guessed that amount. Um, and it's not, it's not on its own. There are, if you do a little bit of research, I think Sydney's a bit higher. I think Sydney is 50%, Greater Sydney is 50%. Um, but it's surprising how much green space are, is in cities. Um, and it's made up as, as we know, parks, sports fields, um, nature reserves, and importantly, gardens and brownfield and scrub. 
Um, and interestingly, uh, London Wildlife Trust um, did a report quite a few years ago now. But yeah, it would be 2009, I think. Um, if we look at the denudation of that, uh, the green area in Greater London, it's surprisingly not through development. The greatest denudation is through concrete in front gardens for cars, put in patios in back gardens. It's loss of gardens. Um, and I, I do despair that we think more as a human community of a piece of metal which doesn't move for 22 hours a day rather than nature. There's plenty of room for cars. I live in a Victorian London suburb and basically the roads around here are car parks. Uh, the cars don't go anywhere and particularly during COVID. The other thing about London is it's not the classic concentric city. So when we saw that rural um, earlier slide where I was talking about the rural urban divide, um, uh, the, there's a gradient in species. It's not necessarily the case because of the way London is made up. It's not a concentric city. It's been built over, it's a very historic city that's been built over generations and generations of different, um, well, arguably invaders. Um, yes, and so all those green spaces are important and they're important whether, whether they are sports fields or whether they are nature reserves or whether they are scrub or brownfield sites. Um, we have about, I think it's around 150 nature reserves in London. Some of them are quite small. Um, and we've got still left, thank thankfully, um, although that may change with the change in planning laws, which um, are coming through. Um, the, the maybe it, it could easily affect our scrub and brownfield sites. The other interesting thing, of course, about London is it's not farmed. Yes, the green spaces, and I'm sure all of you have got an example, may be managed badly, but it's not farmed. So it doesn't have that pressure. And in fact, most councils, not all of them, most councils have actually got better. They are providing long grass in their park space. They are providing wildflower meadows. Um, it's, th there is an issue, I do believe, over private landlords and the uh, malpractices of using too many herbicides and pesticides. But certainly councils are, are starting to get on board. I know Southwark, for instance, uh, as much as possible have said that they um, are nasty, nasty uh, pesticides are not on their list of uh, use anymore. And just to give some examples also, uh, particularly relevant today, actually, um, we all know the wildlife doesn't park up on a, on a nature reserve. Um, scrub and brownfield is really important. Um, I was on a field trip few years ago and um, it was in Norfolk, it wasn't in London, but we got a heads up uh, of a nightingale um, territory and uh, so we said oh give us the direction and they said oh go down the A so and so, you get to this roundabout and then you go about 200 metres down, you take a left, 200 metres down you'll see a big truck stop and over the road there's a couple of acres of asphalt where they park up the wagons and they're there. Oh, all right. So we drove there, got there about half past two in the afternoon, got out of the car and immediately heard a nightingale and around the edge um, was some scrubby patches with, and um, we were very lucky because we've got a male actually showing very well, just singing his heart out while, and I'm not kidding you, 30 feet away, a guy had come out of the truck stop, got in his cab, started the diesel, warming it up, warming the engine up, so lots of diesel fumes, not 30 feet away from this wonderful nightingale. So, he took, um, birds don't read signs, they park up anywhere. Um, and more pertinent, closer to home in Greater London, this small site of scrub, I'm standing right hand side, picture uh, is obviously, it's a partly a car park and a, a bit of road 
it's a station car park in fact and then i turn 180 degrees i take a photo of about i don't know just under an acre of scrubland and i was lucky that day two years ago there was five species of breeding warblers um, listed there um, so really important these rough sites this this site here is really pertinent today the top top site is a picture of a brownfield site it's a, it's a rubbish picture i know but in that area there are breeding skylark every year it's swanscombe marshes um, where for years there's been um, a chance of a sort of disney theme park water park development it's always been put off uh, not by um, uh, nature lovers so much as uh, developers not having the money but they've gone in for planning permission again and so today bug life have started a petition it's very pertinent don't that's an accident actually that i'd use that um but that site and um, it is it has breeding marsh harrier has breeding bearded tit breeding skylark not every year but some years breeding cuckoo uh, this is an urban brownfield site the picture below uh, is a picture of one of my local parks. It's Crystal Palace Park and that area of scrub that you see on the left hand side with a sort of metal white sign every year, white throat um, breed there. Um, and locally talking about, you know, some special, uh, a special site close to me. Um, and what's uh, which is a good ex example of what's happening, what can happen in urban. Um, areas. Sydenham Hill Woods, probably most of you know it, it's London Wildlife Trust's first reserve. Um, it's been extremely well managed for wildlife. I don't think uh, that's, uh, I, I, um, I, I believe in rewilding, but I think it's very difficult in urban areas when you've got smaller spaces. And, it, and Sydenham Hill Woods has its particular star bird species. You do get it, Hobbies haven't been around this year, but um, five crests have bred there. I've been breeding there the last couple of years. Every year there's tawny owl. Um, but I do want to say that it, it does suffer from its own success. Um, there's been a loss of understory because visitor numbers have increased. And these figures are actually before COVID. And you can imagine there's been a lot more pressure since lockdown. Um, and so there has been a loss of understory, and you can see that has affected what I call the skulkers, robin, blackbird, wren uh, numbers um, to a, a small degree. But over time, it's now 10 years that they've been counted, over 10 years actually. Um, and dogs off leads, and, and, uh, and, and, and of course, the presence of um, cats as well. Um, but I would say that if this site wasn't managed the reduction in those uh, the reduction would it'd be a steeper steeper slope uh, and in fact there's an, ex an example of that is the nearby Dulwich Woods which is not managed by um, London Wildlife Trust and the understory is visibly a lot less in percent than Sydenham Hill Woods and before you ask yes in those woods there is an increase of ring neck parakeet. Um, and generally, um, I, I just thought I'd round up this point of the importance of, uh, uh, of urban environments for birds. Is recently black cappers have been doing well in urban environments, not just London. Um, one of the reasons is there's a recent paper on black cap, uh, some of you may have read, which has stated that they're part of their success has been the um, secondary feeding. So for, for us providing um, uh, bird feeders or some of us in, in our gardens and because urban areas tend to have a higher concentration or a higher density, black cats have done well in urban environments. Reed warbler is all, also, and that's for two reasons. We are um, increasingly um, putting reed beds into local parks in urban environments as well as as larger reed beds reed warbler numbers are therefore increased 
but there's another reason going on and it's, that's something a bit more complicated to do with climate change where reeds are, grow, are starting to grow earlier so the reed warbler has a longer um, uh, breeding period and some more qualitative examples um, that are picked up which are closer to my home is peregrines are in Camberwell this year um, West Norwood they've been for two years although they don't think they bred this year and you may have seen on Facebook the hobbies in Lewisham Park while people are picnicking under the tree and they successfully got oh, I don't know is it three chicks two or three chicks so what so I've talked about if you like the misnomer of the countryside um, and urban environments aren't particularly that bad for nature but so what well the important thing is this is the big the nub of it most of us are urban most of us live in urban environments 82 percent in the uk live work in urban environments and that's a worldwide phenomenon um urban environments are getting bigger in terms of population um the there is it's 54 percent in as you can see 2014 um they they think it will be 66 percent by 2050 however the way developing countries are developing that could easily uh increase higher than 66 percent by then um so we are an urban species more and more so we're becoming an urban species but cutting across that increasingly we have found out there's hundreds of papers out there hundreds of scientific papers and word of mouth and we know ourselves that proximity and access to nature amongst other things provide us with a better physical well-being a better mental well-being it reduces stress whether it's just our back garden or looking at our balcony there are scientific papers to say that it aids recovery and speeds recovery from certain illnesses there are also papers out there that prove that um, it can reduce crime and antisocial behavior so there's the rub so uh, it's because we're talking about countryside versus urban i can't stress this too much the so what is about us it's about yes we are here and we care for nature and we want nature to thrive but the populace it's about us and our well-being what can we do well part part of the problem of of thinking of urban areas as or, or if you like a traditional way of perceiving urban areas as less or as more hostile to nature compared to the countryside the so-called countryside one of that one of the problems is is that perpetuates some myth which creates disengagement and there is a loss of, of, of nature we've seen there's been a loss of numbers in urban environments as well as country environments and but together so we've got that perception we've got the historic part of the disengagement and we have the genuine loss of which has created what a lot of scientists have called the extinction of experience. In other words, a good example of that would be my son, who's 19. He's never heard a cuckoo. He's born and bred in London, never heard a cuckoo. So what's it matter? Because he's not missing anything. That's the extinction of experience. And that's, that's a real concern. I call it also the Joni Mitchell syndrome. They say paradise put up a, a parking lot well if you've only experienced the parking lot you haven't missed paradise so the key um just to sum up really the key the key for me is, is engagement and i know it's a 
it's an expression that's banded about in conservation, but I think it is, it is important. Um, for a start, we could be, rather than engagement, we could be more prescriptive. Um, how can we be more caring towards nature and the environment? We could do all these things, and some of you may do all of them. All of us probably do some of them. We save water, we don't leave tap running when we're doing our teeth. Uh, we've got more energy efficient um, washing machines. Uh, ditch the car, it's good, and uh, I know a lot of people are not using their car so much. We recycle. Responsible pet ownership, I mean by that things like walking the dog on a lead in uh, more environmentally sensitive areas. And more and more people are taking up wildlife friendly. The list goes on. We could rip up our patios and sneer at our neighbours. Yeah, we could all do that and we could go vegan. The problem with that prescription is it is a prescription and it's a bit dictatorial. And it can leave you thinking when the next door neighbour doesn't do their recycling properly, it's like rearranging deck chairs on the Titan, can't it? Um, so this engagement thing i think is really important because it's a bit more if you like sexy it's a bit more of a driver that we can all be involved with and share and that's why i say we need to change from the center that's the uh, nub of it rather than the per periphery and from the bottom not the top and what i mean there a good um, an example of that i want to bring in another andrew this time andrew ma andrew ma show the political show on a sunday it was a couple of weeks before the Brexit vote. So we hadn't voted on Brexit. And there was a representative from the three so-called major parties. There was no Green uh, member there. And he put a bit of a loaded question and said, hmm, what about the environment after Brexit, uh, the Brexit vote? And somebody, and it does, it's irrelevant which party representative said, said, well, of course it's, um, we're going to have to think about growth. We're going to have to think about economics and getting um, unemployment. And that was sort of like what the comment I expected. But what concerned me was that the other two who hadn't answered the question nodded sagely. So there was no actual argument against that. And putting it actually what we really should be having is the environment at the top of the agenda. Um, it isn't going to happen without us doing something. So what can we do? Uh, so I think the very fact you're an RSPB meeting and I'm here as well, and I love, I love my birds and blah, 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 is that we think we are engaged. And, I th uh, I think, and, and hats off. Yes, and I think we all do our bit. Hats off. But I think... We also just ought to be a way that we can up our levels, if you like, do a bit more. I'll give you an example, and this is a real life example that happened to me. And you'll see it's about the hobby, the bird. And it happened to me a couple of years ago. I'm in Brixton. It's 7.30 in the morning. I'm on my push bike. I'm going to work. Um, thankfully, I don't work there anymore. But anyway, yeah, I'm on my usual trip. I'm on a major road in Brixton and I'm in the box at the lights in front of the cars. So that, you know, that designated box for, that often gets usurped by cars, but no, they were good that morning. And I'm looking at, obviously at the lights, waiting for the lights to change. And in the peripheral vision, I get five, uh, sorry, four birds. And yeah, and my brain actually, well, it's it, not because my brain's very quick. In fact, it isn't. But but actually, uh, what what he did, uh, the brain then went. That's three birds and one other bird. There's two different species there, Dave. And three of those birds are carrying crows, and they're chasing another bird. And the other bird is a hobby. And you're in the centre of Brixton, and it might be its first day of migration back to West Africa. This is amazing. I am now, my heart's going, oh, I'm just going, what? I've got another half an hour to ride to work. I'll get to work. And I go, hey, lads, guess what I saw? And as I had four colleagues. They were all male colleagues. And uh, guess what I saw? And, I, and they went, well, 
on my way to work, I saw a hobby in Brixton. And yeah, what's a hobby? And I said, oh, it's, it's, it's a bird. Two of them walked away, rolled their eyes, Dave and his birds. The other two didn't. The other two were engaged. They said, oh, I've never heard of that. What is it? And I said, it's a bird of prey, blah, blah, blah. It migrates, comes all the way from West Africa, blah, 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 blah. And they were genuinely interested. And that's, here we go, here's a bit of a <laughs> management consultant type diagram. I think engagement is a really, has different aspects to it. And these are the aspects that, there may be others that you could name. Engagement, there it is at the heart of the matter. What does it give us? It gives us enjoyment. It gives us fulfillment. And that hobby was a great example of that. I was putting, well, not just all day, I was sharing that experience and that's the communication aspect. I was sharing that and I'm sharing it with you now, two years on. Um, but if we then up our level, what happens is, if we up our level of engagement, we get more enjoyment, we get more fulfillment, we communicate more about our experiences, but we also care more they're more concerned about the environment. And that's something, this communication and care and concern is the big issue. It's the big thing for engagement. When we share with people, they hopefully get engaged on a level. Um, so I said this, look, listen, learn. And I think another thing, going back to our mental health, it all ties it in together, doesn't it? We all walk around with this thing, this internal discourse, this conversation in our head. It goes off every now and again. It stops when we particularly get engaged with something. And that is a fantastic thing about nature. I, uh, I'll give you another example. I'm walking down the embankment uh, and two crows landed very close to me and a friend and we I hadn't seen for ages. He, he wasn't, he's, he's all right on nature. And we were talking, we were deep in conversation, but these crows were very close to us. It was slightly, and they'd found some, uh, some carrion uh, and they were eating it, but they, they were allowing us to be really close and we stopped talking. We stopped conversing and we looked at them because they were so close and we could see all the different blacks, the different hues, the violet, black the blue black the green black and then they just sort of sidled away and flew over the Thames and then we looked at each other and I said you notice that that stopped us talking and that was classic engagement so up your levels you're already engaged give yourself a pat on the back and I'm not I don't want to be prescriptive I think it's just think about all those things that you promised yourself, was it to go, I don't know, get a new plant for the garden or oh, I might take up wildlife garden. I was going to get that book on butterflies I've always promised myself. Oh, I ought to start feeding a bit. Anything, moan to your country. If that's your, if that's your vote, um, you want to be a bit more political, do it. Um, and in summary, I think I've gone on quite a bit. I, I need a bit of water. In summary, I hope that in some way I've challenged what we mean by the so-called countryside, which is always, um, sort of, it gives that idea of us versus them, rural versus um, urban, nature versus no nature. There's a loss of birds, there is a loss, I've acknowledged uh, that, there's a loss of birds in all environments. Uh, Great to London has nearly 50% green space. I didn't mention that there is a commitment to increase that 47 to over 50% by 2050 by the Mayor of London. Not sure how he's going to do it, but there's a commitment. The important thing is we are urban and we are becoming more urban worldwide. And one of the things we can't rely on a top down approach, we have to rely on us and engagement is the key. That's a few bits and bobs, bit of few references that I used and that's me.